Okay, now it says we're live. <laughs> Took a second. Yes, this is the September Hangout. Uh, joining us so far is Johnny and David. Hello, guys. Uh, uh. Sorry, spaced out. No pun intended. <laughs> Yeah, I figured I'd better go ahead and do this before the hurricane rolls in. It's not supposed to be a hurricane by the time it comes to this point, but uh, it should probably be like a tropical storm or something. But I, I might be underwater, so if there's no podcast this weekend, just wait until it all drains. <laughs> It'll be back. Well, last I checked, Lord Killian was a skeleton, so I yeah, think water is going to be an issue. Space, he doesn't have to worry about it. Unlike us Earth dwellers. Oh, wait. No, it, it's funny because before they revised the path, that projected path of the hurricane was going like right through my sister's house. And now it's uh, going to the south of us. So it's better now. Whew. So anyway. What's well, up with you, Johnny? I've been, uh, things have been been nothing short of awful. A doggo got put down. I told you this on the Discord DMs. Yeah. My folks got sick after we headed back from Alaska. And now my mom tripped and sprang her ankle something fierce. Ooh, Ankles in a brace. Yeah. Mm. Let's just say 2018 has not been a good year. <laughs> and the icing on top, this whole Article 11 and 13 nonsense. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Dankula and Sargon have already posted a lot about those. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, and Minka in the chat says at least school is canceled, LMFAO, but yeah, they haven't canceled it here yet. I guess they're waiting to see what it's like, but I mean... They should, and they were saying something about if they cancel schools, then they were going to use the schools as evacuation centers for people who got flooded out. I mean, if they're going to do that, they should go ahead and do it, right? So just let people know, let people, you know, make plans ahead of time. Executioner in the chat. And also NCAP Deist Artist, MinCap Kid. And way up at the top was Al Bukshi. I sent him a message. He's a co-host, so he can come in and join us if he wants, but maybe. Maybe he'll join us. Maybe he'll just stay in the chat, whatever. I might share the chat screen again if interesting things start happening, but it sounds like it's just me now. David and Johnny are being kind of quiet, so. Yeah, it does seem like there's more action in the chat. Let me share that. Okay, now you can all see. Uh, sorry to hear that, Executioner. Executioner, you've posted, you've, you've co-hosted the podcast too, so you can use that link in the Discord to come and join us if you want. And Angry Froman, I'm going to extend that invitation to you as well since you uh, uh, since you moderate both of my Discord servers. So I can throw that to you as a, as a bone if you want to join us. I'll send you the link. Let me know. Yeah. Plus your plus your right in enemy lines with the whole st with the whole Article 13 business. So you can chime in your two cents. Executioner said he had a falling out with someone. Yeah. Oh, that's always terrible when that happens. Punch in the gut. I tell you, because it's like my daughter's in high school and she's going on about all the drama. Like, you know, people are just having falling outs and just, you know, threading rooms, just being crappy to each other. I'm like, well, sorry to tell you, kid, but that happens when you're an adult, too. Yeah, it is what it is.
So, Johnny, what's your opinion on the uh, Article 11 and 13 stuff? I could go on for hours about how much I hate what those bureaucrats over on the on their side of the pond is, but TLDR, I'm not happy about it. At all. Well, no one else is saying that, so feel free to rant. <sighs> all right, let me just start by saying that my opinion on the EU has gone from bad to worse. I initially thought they were just a bunch of socialist status types, but I just re now realize that they are a bunch of um, pro-censorship, no anti-free speech, anti-free internet useful idiots who have no place in civilized society. Their argument is that we resorted to ending fascism in the middle of the 20th century, and we did, but the same could be said about communism. And not only did we fight wars over both, we were a major component in the fall of the USSR, the most totalitarian and red government the world has ever seen. And the fact that they even considered doing this on such a massive level just goes to show how desperate these statists are to control everything. Well, and it seems to me it's more of the, the European Commission doing it, because from what Dankula was saying... The MEPs, they tried to ask him about it, and the MEPs didn't even know anything about it. They hadn't even read it, you know, like we keep talking about here. Politicians are just passing things based on what other people tell them, you know, the little sound bite. Oh, yeah, this will be great for content makers. And by content makers, of course, they mean the big media groups, not a small fry. But, you know, they just bought into it. They didn't bother reading it. They didn't bother, you know, trying to get any other. They could not talk at all knowledgeably about what's actually in the thing. And of course, I could mention downsized DCs read the Bills Act because that's a that's a good thing. Because it was like when the um it was, it was the Patriot Act uh, in two thousand one. Not right only after did the Twin Towers hit, my friend. Yep. Not only did the House pass without reading it, the House voted on it before there was even a copy available for them to read. And many cat kid, uh, kid in the chat says, statism is gay. Uh, don't insult gay. Gay's a lot more awesome than statism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, plus, I have, no, I have nothing against the LGBT community in the slightest. Besides, what two consenting adults do in the bedroom is N-O-M-B. None of my business. Oh, uh, Executioner wants you to DM the link, Shane. Yeah, I'm getting it. All right. Oh, MCAP is, uh is bisexual. I didn't know that. Today, I have learned something very, very interesting. Today I have learned something very, very interesting. See, this is what the live stream is like when we don't have Charles or Chris monopolizing it. Or Daniel. Daniel, Daniel's pretty good. Daniel, you can get a word in edgewise. Yeah, David, we need more co-hosts. Yeah. Yeah. Besides, we don't want we don't want uh Charles, Daniel, or anyone else monopolizing our shtick. Yeah. I still remember the fact that he monopolized our freaking Las Vegas stream. I mean how That's many fine. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, at the time is. we didn't know much. Yeah. Wasn't much to talk about. Yeah. And while we're on the subject of that, the uh, 
Las Vegas PD decided to close the investigation. What did they find out? What did they determine? Nothing. So, guy came in, shot up a bunch of people for no reason. End of. Oh, hi, ANCAP Jason Voorhees. I, I mean, executioner. <laughs> That's an executioner's mask, not a hockey. It's, it's Dapperton that has a hockey mask. I see Daps is more like Logic's ANCAP cousin. Yeah, he he based a lot of what he did off of logic, and off of and I think also of uh, armored skeptic. Yeah, can't really imagine why. Also, yeah, we had fun with that. that, that we had fun with that in that first Libertoons episodes where uh, there's a clone ray and it hits logic and then it clones. Uh, it, it, armored skeptic comes out. Then we hit armored skeptic and Dapperton comes out and they're all clones of each other. Yeah, though I really don't appreciate Dabs blowing up the Earth. Just a minor little bit. We got it back somehow. Oh my. I get Dabs meant well, but he should have told us that he was colorblind sooner. Then it wouldn't have been funny. Ancap Deist Artist says the EU is slowly becoming a blue flagged version of China. The difference is China's cutting itself off from the internet. Everyone else is cutting Europe off because the first there's all this GDPR stuff. And I actually got this. It was some kind of weird screw up with um one of the um one of the news sites. I forget all right, what it was, but I was clone himself. <laughs> What's going on here? Executioner clone. There's two of them. Oh my god. Oh, sorry, Shane. Uh, my uh, my mic is acting weird on the uh, on my PC, so I'm just restarting it. Okay, that's cool. It is what it is, man. But yeah, I was I had to find a link to another Bogosity story last week because one of the news sites kept coming up and says you're in Europe and we can't give you our website because of GDPR. And I'm like, I'm not in Europe. <laughs> they yeah, he's in North Carolina, people. <laughs> It's it's IP based geolocation. It doesn't work for crap. <sighs> ah, <it's hard. laughs> Are you my mommy? <laughs> uh, uh. Ah, it's that Our for our first Doctor Who reference of the night. Hello. Are you my mommy? <laughs> Uh, I can't wear the filter because there's asbestos in here. <laughs> oh god! Oh, that's that's like a new thing the the liberals are going on about because they flood my email with all this sort of stuff. Supposedly, the the Republicans are horrible people because I don't know what this has to do with Republicans, but a lot of the first responders and the 9-11 attacks, they say breathed a lot of asbestos and are having all these health problems. I'm like, there was no asbestos in the Twin Towers. Wait, there was though. It was like up until the, uh, I think it was half of the building was filled with asbestos. Well, Because what I had read was they had actually said if they had if they had used asbestos it wouldn't have collapsed because they used a foam insulation. And when the impact happened, it shook off all the foam insulation. And that's, that's what allowed the steel beams to heat up. Well, it was halfway done with asbestos. It was just that the environmentalists said, Oh, we don't want asbestos going on. Then, uh, then half of the building started collapsing because of steel and it just collapsed. <sighs> Yeah, I remember when I was in high school, they had all that stuff about uh, it was built like whatever it was in the 50s or 60s, and they put asbestos in it. And so this was the 80s, and they were like, oh, we got to get all the asbestos out. And so, you know, we had to do all this stuff, and all those par these parts were closed off while they kept getting the asbestos out. And it was like that what, what they were saying was we had to stay out of there. It was like, wait a minute. So you're putting us in more danger by removing the asbestos. They're just leaving it where it was where we weren't breathing it. And that's another thing. 
And also, it's it's also it also spits on the graves of the three thousand people that died on that day. Yeah. No, man, that that didn't happen, bro. That was uh, that was CGI, live CGI, like the moon landing, bro. <laughs> Hi, right, David. Oh, are, <laughs> you, you know you can talk in the chat, David. You're here, but he says, "Aren't there several types of asbestos, and only one or two are actually carcinogenic?" I think I covered that in one of my Lord Killing videos to Tom Hartman, but I don't remember uh, yeah, exactly. There how There are it is. several types. Yo, bro, it's uh, it says uh, it's like live CGI, man. Like the flat earthers claim that they claim that the weather can exactly match the CGI, even though no CGI computer artist has ever been able to do that. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure nowadays you could, because it's it's a lot easier with uh, PBR materials and things like that to actually be able to do you know, ultra photo realistic stuff, but not in 2001. Yeah. Not live. Not live. Fuck it. We'll do it live. This is a look. Of, this is the look. This is the face of somebody who is already tired of your nonsense executioner. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a lot of, that's why I'm a very popular kid at school. Sarcasm. Yeah. <sighs> in uh yeah at my school we have to do like a project at the end of the year to show community and stuff like that so i chose to teach seventh and eighth graders and even seniors cyber security cool ah. they are actually allowing me to teach a class <laughs> I think it's over again, but it was like a month or two ago, Humble Bundle did that thing where you get a lot of, you know, the cybersecurity books and they had done the same thing last year and I picked them up. And so they might, they might do it again. So keep an eye out for it. Yeah. But there's all sorts of great ones from like Bruce Schneier and Kevin Mitnick and all, all, all sorts of greats. At my school, that was today. We did like the whole college, uh, <laughs> college process, you know, the federal aid, that type of stuff. And the person was saying, uh, our, admissions whatever uh, advisor said oh if you have a password store it on your phone which okay that isn't as bad but store it on a piece of paper somewhere and i'm like no well it, it kind of depends don't store it on a piece of paper and tape it to the monitor or something like that but if you've got like a master password that for your uh for your password vault and it would be disastrous uh, if you lost it, then you can write it down and put it with your secure papers, yeah. like your birth certificate, your social security card, all your important stuff that it would be disastrous if it got away from you. And yeah. But she was saying, like, write down your username and password on, like, a sticky note and place it somewhere. And I'm like, no. uh, depends on the place, you know. But um, I mean, if you've got a place where only you have access to, you know, it's fine. You know, the the Chinese aren't going to hack it or anything like that. So, yeah. But uh, some Shane, people it's not at my Chinese school, we should worry about it's the Russians. Some Don't people you know at my they school, the I've noticed. They Doesn't matter who, they can't the hack keyboard. bits of paper from over the Internet. You know, <laughs> you didn't know I was it. being sarcastic, right? They've taped it under their keyboards. Yeah, that's another popular one. Uh, that's what a lot of people do. They like, you know, go through office buildings, looking on monitors, looking at the keyboards, and they get passwords. You know? They get a job with like the cleaning crew or something like that, and then they go through and get everyone's passwords. That's happened. My uh, my operating system was booting there. Windows ninety eight. Ninety eight, huh? That's retro. Yeah. Um... Rest in peace, my eardrums. <laughs> It's sorry. Sorry, I 9 11 your eardrums. No, you're not! It was, uh, it was in school. I don't know how, but we had to write a, uh, kind of like a six word memoir, what Ernest Hemingway did or whatever. And, uh, we had to write one about 9 11. And, uh, I said, Tragedy and Aftermath Congress molested freedom. Yep, that's that's pretty much it. It's funny because it's true. 
my teacher looked at me with the most glaring look as I was walking out of the classroom <laughs> at the end. And I'm like, but Good it's job. true. And Good somebody job. else had one that was worse. They said, conspiracy, Bush did 9-11. Oh, God. <laughs> no, that, but that, yours is kind of like an episode of, of Parks and Rec. When, um, oh God, I'm drawing the blank on the, the guy's name, but the libertarian character talks to that little girl about government. And after he's done with her, she writes a report on how government works. And it's just two words. It doesn't. Yep. Ron Swanson, that's his name. Yeah, I'm going to try the, uh, I'll, I'll be back. Yeah, I miss having a show with, with a character that's that blatantly libertarian. He was great. Well, whatever the case, uh, let's see. NCAP DS artist in the chat says, Ted Cruz's holograms were surprisingly realistic. The attack was a distraction from his last Zodiac victim disposal. Hillary and Bill were also in on it. Well, you know, it's difficult to hide the fact that he's really a lizard person from outer space. So, Well... I'll only, I'll only be convinced of that if he put chemicals in the water that turn the frickin' frogs gay. Welcome back, Executioner. Yep. Welcome you know, back. This is a story the all about <laughs> history. I walked into Staples and I just made a parody of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air song. And I go, This is a story all about how my tech career got twisted and upside down. And I'd like to take a second and sit right here and tell like, you how I became the Fresh catchy. Prince of Staples. And I just went through, it was back in the 90s. I worked at Comp USA. I got fired. <laughs> then I went on to explain, uh, I walked into Staples. It seemed all cool. Uh, they called security and booted me out the door. I said, why? And they said, you're singing like a maniac in the middle of the store. Is CompUSA even around anymore? Uh, it's a website. Yeah, that's pretty much what a lot of them are. I think Radio Shack is just a website now. Yeah. And doesn't even have the same selection of stuff they had in their actual store. Harry Alexander in the chat says... It doesn't is too long. I just write poorly. <laughs> I actually miss CompUSA, though. <laughs> actually, I never really grew up around CompUSA, but I grew up around, like, Circuit City and stuff like that. Yeah, there's another one. They might be just a website nowadays, too. Yeah. I, I'm actually going to find it, because... Vaccines <laughs> from the moon? Seriously? <laughs> Comp USA. It's now Tiger Direct. Oh, it is? Yep, I think it's now Tiger Direct, or it's owned by Tiger Direct. Yeah, but they, now they, they must have bought it, because Tiger Direct was around when Comp USA was still a store. But Yeah. I think wow. they just bought them out or something. I'm not sure. David R. says, remember, vaccines from the moon hoax cause chemtrails, thus proving there's no curve on the grassy knoll. Well, I think you got to figure it out there, David. <laughs> totally, man. And, uh, I can imagine what's going to be on the highlight reel. I just, I was in school today and somebody screwed up one of the computers. They decided to unplug everything um, and the monitor wouldn't connect again. So I'm just like, screw this. I take the SSD out of one, take the good SSD, put it inside of the one that had the bad SSD. But, oh, that might fix it. And nope, the monitor's just shit. Yeah. Out there, you, sir. This is a Christian Minecraft server, sir. Been a, been a pin or something? Hmm. Could be a bent pin. Uh, I'm not sure, but... Um, but... Yeah. Oh, Comp USA found him. Uh, it just sends me to Tiger Direct. What the hell? Harry yeah. Alexander in the chat says, "After the story with the cats and mind control, I wouldn't be surprised at this point." You know what? They're putting things in the cat food to make the cats gay. <laughs> An angry Froman in the chat says, I had a professor who was an anti-vaxxer and believed in chemtrails. 
Believe it or not, I actually was able, I think a couple days ago, I was debating a status at my school. Uh, pardon me, gentlemen. I got to get some details. There were a lot of status at my school, and I was debating one, and they pulled out four things in a row. The no true Scotsman, the, um, the Tin Man fallacy. Uh, they pulled out a whole bunch of stuff. They pulled out the... Uh, Damn it, I'm missing one of them. Uh, basically, they were pulling every straw man out of the book. And uh, I said, in a society where there's private security, you, in our society, as in the current society we have now, a police officer can get away with shooting an unarmed black man. But in the society I'm proposing, the market would, uh, would basically not allow that to happen since that person couldn't get a job afterwards and... After that, it would just be more accountable. And the person straw manned me and said, so in your system, you can shoot unarmed black men without consequences? So you're saying... Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They, uh, he did that, and there was actually this uh, person who I thought was a statist, uh, one of my friends, and she just kind of, uh, kind of just intervened and said taxation is theft, and believe it or not, she's a voluntarist communist. Believe it or not. Wow, how does that work? I have no idea. She believes in voluntarism and believes in the concept of people can have their communes, just don't force it on other people. Basically, well, I mean, I that, just... that's capitalism. You know, when, when you're talking about things like that, it's not about what you would want to do. It's about what you will tolerate others doing. So what would she do if other people on their property are doing things the capitalist way, if she would just let them do it, then she's a capitalist because she respects private property. But communism is based on the idea of private property being theft. Yeah. Holding private property to a communist is itself an act of aggression. So. And believe it or not, she used to be like an anti-gunner. She hated guns and all this stuff. But then I went on to say about how the society would work and people would be armed and stuff like that. And she totally did a 180 and agreed with it. And I'm like, wow. How in the hell does that so work? So she just kind of goes along with whoever's in the room at the time. Eh. I'm not really sure, though. She kind of did say, uh, I kind of explained how most mass shootings, most school mass shootings are actually events where it's an accidental discharge of a firearm. And it, nobody gets hurt pretty much, but they count it as such. And uh, there was a guy who kind of walked away saying, nope, that's not true. Then uh, she heard me out. And when he came back, she kind of went, well, if you heard him out, he's actually speaking the truth and stuff like that. So it's kind of interesting. I'm just going to get this chat up here in the, the window so you, everyone can pause the video and just read what they're saying. I'm not going to read any of them out. Yo, man, a win. Yo, Tiger Direct selling a fire Opteron from 2006 for $400. Okay. I'm like, what? Why? I have no idea why they would price it so ridiculously. What what did those things cost in 2006? Like $2,000, I think. Not sure. Yeah, but I mean, when you compare it to something you can get today for $400. Yeah. I mean, it's no contest, right? Yeah. There was this uh, kid at my school who was into computers and stuff, and he said to me, just get an old Opteron from 2007 with 12 cores and get a quad core, uh, get a quad uh, socket thing and try to make a PC out of it. And I'm like, well, what's the point? I can just go and spend the money I would spend on that on a stronger CPU. And he said, well, it's 64 cores. <laughs> I sound to sneeze at. Although more and more it's becoming the GPU that's important, not the CPU. Yeah. Get a good graphics card. Although I notice more and more I have a lot of things fighting for the graphics card. Like if I'm trying to render something, 
in Blender or Vegas. It slows down if I have Photoshop and Firefox and Chrome open because they're all fighting for resources on yeah. the GPU. Isn't it uh, as as technology improves, render times remain constant? Yeah, that's uh, Blend's law. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's like Toy Story, when they did Toy Story, I think it took four years for them to do it. When they're doing, you know, like Brave or, you know, Cars 3 or a lot of the new ones, they're still spending that four years. They're still spending, you know, the same amount of time on it. They're just doing so much more with it. They've got hair. They've got fur. They've got the uh, the finish on the cars, you know, making things ultra yeah. realistic. Yeah, that's what we actually... I actually noticed that when I was in computer animation class, uh... I noticed that a lot of the times when a lot of the times we would have to do render farms because uh, a lot of stuff we were animating, a lot of people would crank the settings up by whatever amount and uh, at the they would crank it up to ridiculous levels. And I'm like, uh, you're going to make it longer. And they said, well, yeah, but it's a more powerful computer show. It should be less time. And I'm like, uh... That makes no sense. Well, then it depends on how much more powerful it is and how much they cranked it up. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um... Yeah. I it's... remember back like, on my Amiga 500 how long it took just to render a sphere. It was like, you know, a couple of minutes. And, yeah. you know, that's instant now. Yeah. Actually, my friend has a Commodore 64 or an Amiga, I think. Yeah, mine died, unfortunately. Or I'd still be playing games on my Amiga if I still had it. Yep. Atari made a lot of computers back in the day, though. Yeah, they weren't as good, though. Yeah. Like the Atari ST, eh. Yeah. It's, uh... I was watching a movie, I think it was Men in Black or whatever, and uh, they were talking about, like, all the technology comes from aliens, supposedly, or whatever. Uh, just kind of they're parroting that whole thing. And they said, oh, this is going to replace CDs. And it's like the mini Sony mini disc or whatever. And and I'm like, wow, that was only four years away from the iPod. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't even have discs anymore. We put them all in the cloud or do streaming. Yeah. Yeah, one channel I do like for retro computer stuff is uh, Lazy Game Reviews, though. It's... Uh, Pretty good. He gets a lot of old uh, computers and fix them up and stuff like that. I'm trying to remember the name of one. There's one I'm subscribed to that's really good, but I can't. I can't think of uh, it. iBook guy or something. No. I think he was the one that did a lot of that expose on Apple's and how they wouldn't let you repair your own iPhone and stuff like that. Oh. I can't remember who. If I remember who it is, I'll put it in the below bar. Yep. Back then, um, back in 2013, my first ever Mac was an iMac G5 from 2006 or whatever. And it was pretty low end, but hell, I got it for a cheap price and it worked for some stuff. Yeah, I did a lot of stuff on the Mac Plus in college. Oh, boy. <laughs> yep. That was like OS 1, you know? Yep. Apple Link. Oh, God, the networking was ridiculous. Oh, God, I'm glad that died. Apple Link, then there was Quantum Link, then it went to AOL. Oh, God, Apple Link was as bad as ArcNet. ArcNet, oh, God. I have, still have nightmares about ArcNet. <laughs> The thing is, when internet started out, it was a glorified radio service in a way, but then it kind of evolved over time when the private market took it over. Yeah, but the problem is, since they were using the, the public uh, telephone packet switching network, the FCC said you can't use the protocols you're developing. You have to use you know, this protocol that ended up becoming TCP IP, and it wasn't built for that. Yeah. yeah. And if they'd use some of these other, I've talked about this before, they'd use some other pro 
protocols with like a proper session layer and everything else where we could do real authentication, then like people, there would be no such thing as spam email because spam yeah. email relies on the sender being anonymous and, you know, you wouldn't just be able to slip it in like they do. Hmm. It's like they wanted to make it unreliable. Well, they were just using it to communicate between them, and they all knew each other, and they knew that none of them were going to misbehave. This is like 20 people or something like that. It wasn't yeah. meant to do banking on or anything like that. There was a guy who committed the first ever cybercrime by sending a personal email about a lost hat because of a conference over in England. And I didn't hear about that. Yep, I think that was the first ever cybercrime recorded back in the 80s. I know a lot of people are getting is like the, the password to Coca-Cola's mainframe was the letter A. You know, <laughs> stuff like that. It was like... Yep. Passwords, you can blame MIT for passwords. It was like in 1960, they just started yep. using passwords just so they could, you know, keep themselves straight again on, they, they all knew each other on their own network there. And it was like less than two years later, you had the first password crack. It was a practical joke. You know, they were just playing jokes on each other. But yeah, I mean, passwords have been cracked for that long and we're using them to secure our banking. What's funny is I was watching a bunch of like 1980s movies like Rambo 2 and I see the huge room full of computers and I'm like, wow, that could be outpowered by an Android Snapdragon. <laughs> yep. Oh, like you, you go back to like the 60s and the room full of computers there, you know, they're outpowered by pocket calculators. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, I hate when the moon landing hoaxer freaking people say, oh, we couldn't have gone to the moon with uh, the computer of a calculator. And I'm like, uh, it, we could because it's just different things back then. They just needed one goal to be accomplished. Well, and all they need to do is just resolve equations on it. That's pretty much all they used it for. They used, you know, pencils and paper for everything else yeah i, I mean I'm the only real difference between that and the computers of today is that instead of getting it you know in a few seconds you can get it in a few billionths of a second it's like well okay yeah. you know what difference would that have made for the moon landing yeah it's like they say oh we have lost the technology to go to the moon no we've only lost the plans to build the saturn 5 it doesn't mean we don't have the technology to go back to the moon. I don't even think it's the case that they've lost the plans. It's just that no one's really going to make it. Yeah. You know, Cause it's, it's outdated. If someone was going to do something, they design a new rocket. They wouldn't use the Saturn five. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, I can't really remember the movie, but it was about the women. I think it was, hidden figures or something like that where it was the movie about the women at NASA who helped do the calculations for the moon landing. And those were like human calculators. Uh, that was in the early stages of Apollo. Then they switched over to the computers and uh, it's kind of like, it's not really a Luddite fallacy, the film, but... Um, it kind of does emphasize that, oh, they lost their job, the computers and stuff like that, even though they went on to work in the computer department. Yeah, it, it, the movies have always been weird about computers because they show these crazy interfaces that could never exist and you can never really work with. And they say, well, oh, well, because that it's visual because real computer screens are boring. And yet, you know, I think Mr. Robot was really the first one to start doing them realistically. And they're showing you, you know, actual hacker utilities being run and stuff like that. And it works. Yeah. I've seen like the movies, like the matrix where they're doing the hacking and stuff like the computers. And it's just strings of text and stuff like that. Like just like flowing downwards. And I'm like, that's not how it works though. Well, the Matrix, I mean, who knows what time that is, and the machines have their own complete... So, I mean, who knows how that would work? They weren't actually 1999 computers. It was at least a few centuries in the future. Yeah. 
The thing about the Matrix, though, I think I'm going to do a video on it. Uh, they have, like, the Animatrix, which is, like, they have a story about how the Machine War started. Oh, and, all, all of the Animatrix is good. If you haven't seen yeah. it, definitely get the Animatrix. And I've watched it, and I kind of went, I kind of criticized part of it for the uh, part of the economic part of it, where, oh, all right, the machines are out for... All right, oh. guys. Okay. All right, see you, Johnny. See the machines are outproducing humans, and therefore the humans went to war and stuff like that. I understand that with the government part, but if anything, the machines wouldn't have replaced them in many other jobs. There would have still been jobs for humans. Yeah, I think what you have to keep in mind about that is that one was like an educational video to let the people of Zion know uh, what had happened. And that was what just what they were able to discover about the past. It's not really the truth. It's just what they were able to to find out about it. So, you know, they had to kind of go from scratch. They didn't have any records to go from. They've had to kind of deduce all of that. Yeah, it's very interesting, though, part of it where the machines, they decide to use humans as power, even though there is plentiful nuclear uh, material around the world at that point which at that point, it kind of, when it shows, oh, the prototypes of them being plugged in, I think one machine, if it, they have artificial intelligence, I think one machine should have just been like, wait, why are we taking 80,000 prisoners of war and making them into a power plant when we could just take their old nuclear reactors? Well, and if you think about it, it's a kind of perpetual motion anyway that wouldn't work. But, I mean, again, we're just talking about what, the people of Zion were able to uh, discover about it. And uh, like, if, I, I like the fan theory that what they were really using them for was while they were in the, the matrix doing all of that, they were also using unused portion of their brains as processing power for the fusion reactors. That could make sense. Because yeah. Morpheus did say it was combined with the form of fusion. Yeah, there's actually a theory by Game Theory where they kind of think that the Matrix is just one part of kind of like a layered network where uh, where they created a Matrix to trick people into believing that they could get out of the Matrix when they're still in the Matrix because Neo can still do the powers and such even out of the Matrix. I didn't think he ever did any of that when he was outside of the Matrix. I think he did it in the second movie. Like, he kind of, like, stops one of the machines or whatever. Yeah, but I was kind of waiting for that, the, the reveal that the real world and Zion and all that was part of a uh, another simulation on top of that, and the computers were just fooling them. But yeah. They wanted to do that, but they the studios thought that people were too dumb to understand that. Well, they did it with, oh God, what movie was that? Where, where you had the dreams inside the dreams inside the dreams? Inception. Inception, yeah. Yeah. They did it there, and I mean, it, it worked, and people were able to follow it. There, there just seems to be this kind of elitism in Hollywood. It's like, um, there was one time, uh, oh God, I forget what it was, but Pendulette was talking about working with an exec on something, and he was like, oh, people aren't going to understand that. It's like, what do you mean? It's simple. It's like, well, you and I understand that, but you have to understand that, you know, the people in Nebraska aren't going to understand it. And I mean, he said yeah. something like, what people in Nebraska are you talking about? Are you talking about the people in Nebraska who are doing brain surgery, programming computers, and all this other stuff, you know? Yeah. There's a screenplay I'm writing where it's about... uh I'm never even sure Hollywood would produce it. It's like kind of like John Wick, but it's like a senior in high school or whatever. And like the family gets killed, but the father was connected to the mob. So he finds money in the backyard, buys a bunch of weapons and goes after them. And with the whole freaking uh, uh, controversy surrounding guns and stuff like that, I to be honest, I think I could only do that if it was an independent film. Just sharing the chat again so people can see that a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah, it's kind of when you write something kind of that a lot of people kind of look 
at it in a way. It's kind of uh, it's kind of the only way to go about kind of like the idea kind of mine is to either find a studio that wants to take a shot on it or independently uh, fund it. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's really amazing just how wrong they've ended up being because, you know, they kept telling for the longest time, oh, you know, each episode has to be, you know, completely self-contained. Most uh, TV shows from like the 60s, 70s, 80s, you could take all the episodes, throw them in a pile, pull them out, watch them in a random order, and it would still make sense. And that's one thing they kept saying to uh, JMS, Joe Straczynski, when he made Babylon 5, was like, oh, people aren't going to be able to follow that. And now that's kind of the model. You know, you've got Breaking Bad and yeah. uh, Orange is the New Black and shows like that, which that's what it's all about. Game of Thrones is basically going to be uh, whatever it is, you know, 80 some hour long movie is basically what it is. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's kind of, I don't know. I learned a lot when writing scripts and stuff like that. When I was younger, I wrote scripts for screenplays, but now I write them and I kind of, I don't know. I noticed that I write more and more detail into the actual scenes because back then I would have a picture in my mind of what I wanted, write down the minimal what I wanted, then like just try to remember it. Then I would kind of forget and I learned it's better to write down write down what you want versus just Absolutely, just, yeah. Yeah. And I actually used to be at my Film. I did a film school over at another school, transferred, stuff like that. And uh, I actually did do a lot of good w work. Um, for some reason, the camera, I was able to focus it in a way where somebody thought it was two separate layers, like I green screened it in. And uh, I said, no, those that's all in camera. And they, they kind of acted surprised, but the person worked in the industry for eight years. And I'm like, uh... I'm kind of like, okay. Was it kind of like stuff like depth of field and things like that that kind of just made the foreground pop out? Yeah. That's one thing they teach you how to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I worked, I worked in that. Um, but yeah, for a high school, I've done like computer stuff. From one school, I did computer stuff. Then I transferred to another uh, school, and I kind of just, in this year, I just kind of went with the whole cybersecurity thing, got a job at my school doing the network and uh, stuff like that. That's cool. They, they took a shot on me, and I did some great work. Yeah, it's good to have multiple skills, because I don't know how many times I've switched industries during my life, but... Yeah, it, it's it's been a a, a good um, a good skill to be able to adapt to to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. Usually at my yeah, usually at my school, I'm not really afraid to be unfiltered. Kind of in a way, I'll say whatever. Uh, I'll say what I want to say, and I don't really care about other people's kind of opinions about it, be it like status and stuff like that. When I say openly taxation is theft and I explain it, I don't care if a statist is like, oh my gosh, um, if there weren't taxes, how would there be schools? And I'm like, uh, let me show you. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I mean, it's like in this country, there weren't any taxpayer supported schools for like a hundred some odd years. Mostly they were Community schools, you know, you got the image of the little one-room schoolhouse, but what you did was you had people in the community. They're like, hey, we got these kids. We need to to teach them. So they just all get together and chip in and, you know, help build the schoolhouse. And, you know, they'd hire the teacher or one of them would volunteer to be the teacher. And they just did it as a community and just everyone just voluntarily chipped in. Yeah. And that made a lot of sense. And the thing about when I tried to... Yeah, at my school, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's kind of like a little bit of overspending in a way because uh, I kind of looked at one thing. They have like this thing they have at malls, like that thing that comes down and like it's a kind of like a cage thing at one of the entrances to prevent a intruder from 
going into a cafeteria or whatever. But yeah. I kind of pointed out one fatal flaw. I'm like, uh, there's it's a chain linked thing. He could just point something through the chain linked thing and just freaking while people are running, just freaking do something horrible. And uh, oh, they were trying he, to use it to deter school shooters. Yeah, they were wow. trying to do it where it would close down during an intrusion or whatever. But one thing I pointed out is it would be smarter if it was metal plated over it where it's just, you didn't have an, uh, you couldn't just stick anything through there. Yeah. And uh, that's the thing about a lot of s school security is that I, I pointed that out. I've said, and I've gotten in trouble for this. I've said, hey, if you really want safer schools, hire private security. Or if the cops are competent, have at least two police officers there or whatever. Or, uh, or just allow teachers to conceal carry because it's, uh, I even told them the statistics. An armed citizen stops a shooting uh, with only one death while police uh, intervene and it ends up being 14 deaths. Yeah, just because it takes the police so long to get there, yeah. And, you know, you talk about the teachers being armed thing. And people go, oh, no, that would be a disaster because kids, kids would be grabbing the guns and teachers would be doing this and that. And I think it's Utah has had it for, I think, over 15 years. If a teacher has a concealed carry permit, then they're allowed to carry a gun in the school. And all that time, nothing. No school yeah. shootings, no teachers going crazy and shooting the kids, no kids grabbing the gun. Yeah. It's not happening. Yeah, my... Uh... My vice principal, when I was discussing this with him, um, basically I was just bringing it up about maybe we should allow that if we can get the uh, state to allow that. Um, and he said, well, what if a teacher leaves their gun in the bathroom? And I'm like, wow. yeah, it's like your key it, yeah, it's like you're leaving your fucking keys on the fucking sink. Yeah. <laughs> and no, uh, I, I don't think, yeah, I mean, it's going to be holstered or something like that, so... I'm like, yeah, the guy's just going to walk around with the gun in his hand. Yeah. I'm just well, looking what is at it, him. It's something like, if you look at the, 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 the portion of people in the population who commit violent crimes with a firearm, police are something like 120th as likely to commit a violent crime with a firearm, and concealed carry permit holders are, I think, like 110th as likely as police to, to, so, I mean, it's, it's a lot, it's even safer for concealed carry holders. Yeah. Than it is as, for a police. as a libertarian in my school, I thought about forming like a libertarian conservative alliance, just getting the conservatives and li uh, libertarians to agree on something and kind of having a club. But after a while, I'm like, no, at my school is so liberal. They would probably just end up screeching about it. Even though yeah. I think it's, I think I said I was at like an LGBT club there or whatever, and I s asked a lot of people, I said, what's your opinion on gay people arming themselves to uh, defend themselves? And about 40 to 45% agreed with the statement of arming themselves, uh, while the other percentage said, Oh, we shouldn't have to arm ourselves. Teach homophobes not to kill, shoot up gay clubs. Okay, first of all, it being a gay club had nothing to do with that. I think we've covered that. <laughs> but I mean, oh yeah, why, why, why do I have to lock my door? Just teach people not to rob houses. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's out. I'm not thinking that through. Yeah, it's very. It, it's funny because I've had multiple teachers of mine and uh whenever i bring up the right to self-defense and the right to bear arms they said for a well-regulated militia and i have a pocket constitution and i pulled it out and pointed yep. straight towards the comma <laughs> where it separates the militia from people this thing yep that's the constitution and the declaration yep uh, believe it or not, my anti-gun teacher gave me a pocket constitution. <laughs> cool. So I'm like, 
hey, I can refute you with your own evidence. Yeah, just read the thing. Yep. It's uh and when you when when you look at what the founders said about how the constitution could be interpreted, if you're wondering what it means, they always said, "Look at the ratification debates." Yeah, I was going to then. We, uh, I I was at my school and I did a report on the Colt Walker pistol, and I was just uh, describing how how it was invented, how it influenced the Industrial Revolution, the Old West stuff like that, and. There were a teacher, I have a teacher that kind of, I have special needs, so they represent me. And um, nowadays they don't really, because I'm going to be 18. So they kind of were saying, oh, uh, change your topic. And I'm like, why? And the person said, well, I knew somebody who was in a, uh, like, a shooting that happened, like, one of my whatever, and... Uh, uh, I think it was some shooting. I can't remember which one it was. But they said, oh, because I had a family member that almost whatever died from it, you have to change your paper. And I'm like, uh, that makes no sense. I just wrote the damn thing and I'm halfway done. You're going to make me write about something else? And, uh, I, and the teacher who was the history teacher ended up uh, uh, getting convinced on an anti-gun stance. So he said, oh, I couldn't write about it. But I went to the actual administration and said, hey, there's no violence in here. There's no advocation of violence. It's just a history report. And they ended up saying, uh, this is outrageous. Um, you should be allowed to write about this. And I was able to keep the damn paper. Well, that's good. Yeah. And it yeah, kind of talk about a non sequitur, though. Yeah, it's kind of, and he said at first we could write anything we wanted about about the uh, Industrial Revolution and uh, American history and stuff like that. And uh, I kind of did that. Uh, I did that, and I've had multiple instances where I conflict with uh, history teachers because they have a very Keynesian point of view of American history. They think that the Great Depression was caused by freaking big, bad companies and stuff like that and when i try to say uh keynesianism doesn't even hold up on basic mathematics they're like oh uh keynes didn't believe in large spending and i'm like what well I, it is true that if you go and you read a lot about what keynes actually wrote a lot of it is, isn't what the modern keynesians are saying so they're actually yeah. going against keynes a lot yeah, but um, they kind of, yeah, I kind of went over that. They said, oh, small deficits are okay. And I'm like, well, that's interference in the market, which is unjustifiable because you're going to get a huge number of problems that caused the Great Depression. And uh, I kind of, we have an uh, economics class, and I just asked them, hey, what, which one are you on right now? Uh, like Mises, Hayek, or... Uh, or Milton Friedman, and they said, no, we're not on any of those. And I'm like, uh, why not? And they said, well, this is just basic economics. And I'm like, well, why not Harry Hazlitt or something like that? And uh, they said, well, this is just the basic things people need to know. And I'm like, well, do you mention Keynes? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, come on. Yeah, Tom Woods has a number of uh, really good lectures on YouTube about, um, you know, the 19th century and, you know, what all the Keynesians claim versus, you know, the what robber it, barons. What is, yeah. Yeah, they always. Yeah, try and to make all, but all like they tell, oh, they're looking at all of these, all these busts in the 19th century. And, you know, that's why we had to have the Federal Reserve. And he was looking at them and pointing them out to today. And it's like, you know, the economy was actually growing at a greater rate. It was actually doing better for the time during the busts than it is today during the booms. Yeah, it's. So we uh, actually I, want one of the yeah. busts back then. I tried debunking a claim of the 1873 uh, panic or whatever. I tried saying uh, that didn't really happen, as a lot of people say, and. Uh, I think one of them brought up tulip mania or whatever. And I'm like, no, that never, never happened. happened. Yeah. 
Well, I and, mean, there was there was like a fad, kind of like you you see here with like and people talk about the Beanie Babies and stuff like that. But a lot yeah. of the stuff that m- most of the stuff people talk about to say, you know, how it was a bubble and how terrible it was, that was all Calvinist propaganda with yeah. no truth behind it. Last year, my history teacher, when we were going over the Great Depression, tried to portray Hoover as the bad guy and FDR as the good guy. And he showed a bunch of pictures about, oh, look at these kids. They're uh, in hard working conditions. And I'm like, "Uh, that was not the norm during the Great Depression or even during the the booms. Uh, Kids weren't really working in factories as much. Yeah, and, and what do they think they were doing before the Industrial Revolution? Do they think kids were just merrily skipping through fields all day? Yeah, freaking uh, playing with a hoop and a stick. <laughs> yeah, just sitting on the side of the creek fishing. Yeah, people didn't really... Uh, and I kind of said that, and I made a very controversial claim with them. I said... Actually, it was better to be a factory worker than a farm worker because at the farm you could catch diseases, wild animals, uh, rabies, stuff like that. Well, I mean, even the animals you're working with are really dangerous. It it is amazing how quickly a cow can kill you. You wouldn't think it of a cow, but they're actually pretty dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, if you get behind a horse in the wrong way, it can kick your spleen. Or you're trying to, to plow something with a mule. You got the mule and you got the plow, and then the mule does something unpredictable. You get kicked and then impaled on the plow or something i mean that that's yeah. pretty dangerous stuff yeah and i kind of tried saying he he tried saying and i wrote this essay saying that the nra the uh, national recovery act was unconstitutional and i was referencing the court rulings and uh they tried saying the ends justify the means basically and i'm like uh that's not how american constitution law works you can't yeah. just <laughs> You can't just say, oh, the government is allowed to do this and that because uh, the common good. (laughs) But it's like I remember, you know, when I was a kid, you know, my dad let let me get behind the Troy built tiller and till the garden with that. And it's like, you know, the equivalent of that in the 19th century would have, you know, I I don't know. You know, it would have been incredibly dangerous. Yeah. I mean, with with a modern tiller, you know, it's pretty safe. There was an inventor who was killed by their own invention because he tried kicking the newspaper press or whatever to get something to go in it, and his leg got caught up in it. And yeah. uh, a lot of people try to say, oh, that's an example of how machinery needed to be regulated. And I'm like, uh, it gets safer over time. Like, no invention is safe at first. It just improves over time. Like the light bulb, the... Uh, arc lights and stuff like that. They were dangerous to eyes, but eventually it got better over time. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's the thing. You have to kind of compare things because it's like most leftists seem to kind of want to compare things to today, you know, from their ivory tower. And they look at the 19th century and they go, well, you know, I wouldn't want to go back to that. And it's like, well, I wouldn't want to go back to that either. But if I had a choice of living in the 1800s or living in the 1700s, I'd pick the 1800s. Oh, he's gone. Oh, well, let's see what the chat room is saying. Uh, did he say something I disagree with? Therefore, you're a neocon, Nazi, etc. Yeah. Uh, Teal Deer just had a, a pretty good video about what are they going to do <coughs> when they um when they run out of people like, you know, once they, they overuse... The whole you're a Nazi thing, you know, and then Nazi becomes this meaningless term. What are they going to go to after that? Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's the same thing I try to point out at my school when people try to say terms, terms that are offensive, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, wait a minute. We've said them so much. They've kind of lost their meaning. And Rogging One wants to know what my problem with the Americans with Disabilities uh, Act is. And I've said this before, that was kind of like my last little bit of statism that I had to kind of overthrow to become uh, 
a pure libertarian because you know when it passed i thought hey you know that that's a good thing you know now people with disabilities can get around better but i mean there was already a trend of people putting in wheelchair ramps because guess what they don't want to lose a sale you know they want people to be able to access it but yeah. the americans with disabilities act turned a lot of that on its head because like they were figuring out ways to hire disabled people you know, and, and figure out how they could help them do their jobs and whatever. But then the ADA passes and it just completely, uh, it, it just completely reversed that because there were all these requirements for things you had to do to hire a disabled person. They were that much more expensive to hire. And a lot of lawyers told these firms, not to hire disabled people because it's a lawsuit waiting to happen if there's like some little jot or tittle that you didn't comply with. Yeah. You know, they could come and take down your whole business. And you even had shyster lawyers who were going around just looking at, oh, well, I don't think that wheelchair ramp is the right slope or whatever. Not based on any actual complaints from any disabled people, but they'd go around and then file all these big yeah. suits against. I mean, it was, it was just horrible was, the way it turned out. There was Penn and Teller's bullshit. Uh, it's a great show. That's actually what kind of turned me into a libertarian a bit. Um, but they actually tested it with the iron lung. They went around with an old vintage <laughs> iron lung yeah. trying to go into businesses. I, I yeah, wish that, that show was still on, though. Yeah, that was great. They wanted to do one on Scientology, but they were getting death threats and stuff. South Park did one on Scientology that was great. Yeah, they did. They do great stuff, South Park. Um, you know, the show Adam Ruins Everything. Yeah. Um, to me, sometimes it just kind of seems like they just watched a bunch of uh, Penn and Teller BS episodes and they kind of tried doing their half-ass version of it. I'd say I pro I'd say, see he, he probably gets it right. I'd say maybe 75, 80% of the time, you know, he, he has some cringe in there, but for the most part, I think it's pretty good. His episode on private prisons was kind of a bit weird though. Well, and there were so many times I'm like, okay, Adam, now take what you've just said to its logical conclusion. And of course, you know, he didn't, but, yeah, he does a great job on some things, but he does an awful job on the glasses episode where uh, he argues about the huge corporations, but he doesn't go to the logical step by saying, hey, it's government supporting these huge corporations. Well, but I think the problem people with that is they're just looking at the college humor video, which is just one segment. And if you watch the full episode after that segment, he does go into the fact that Yes, there are now places online where you can buy glasses a lot cheaper and things like that, and opening that up to competition has really helped things. Yeah, I think that, uh, I don't know, I think that a lot of the, uh, I don't say it's, I think it's kind of left-leaning, not really libertarian-leaning, but... Uh, yeah, it's it definitely left-leaning, yeah. I don't know, I just kind of wish there was a... A uh, show that was kind of like Penn and Teller's BS, but it was still around, you know? Yeah. Because it's just with Adam, he gets it right on a lot of stuff. He gets it right on the uh, drug war. That was a great episode. Um, he got it right on a lot of things. It's just the areas where he gets it wrong is uh, very disappointing, to say the least. When he tries to say oh, here are our citations and sources. Well, that's great and everything, but if your citations don't match up to your claims, then that's not going to look good. Well, and to his credit, he says that. Don't just take my word for it. Check out the citations and make sure I'm right. Yeah. It's, um... <clears throat> um... I don't know. I kind of just, uh... He did a great episode on circumcision. That was a great episode. Uh... But I don't know. I just kind of prefer Penn and Teller's a little bit because it was kind of funnier, but they kind of went into more depth a bit. I think they had a better research team is what it was. Yeah, they they had a great... They were partnered with the Cato Institute, I believe. 
Well, they were they worked with a lot of groups on that. I think it depended a lot on the episode, but yeah, there, there were a lot of different groups they worked with. I think they actually did an episode with Christopher Hitchens or whatever, and uh, it's kind of interesting uh, about the whole Mother Teresa episode. Oh yeah, how she wasn't really the saint everyone makes her out to be. Yeah, it's kind of funny with like though though I'm a deist, I kind of believe in God, kind of kind of leaning Christianity a little bit. I kind of look at Catholicism as kind of like, uh, you're taking it to the logical, you're taking it to the most extreme area where people think that somebody was a saint just because the picture cured someone's cancer or whatever. I don't know. Well, it's funny because in order to be declared a saint, you have to have done a miracle. And it's like, I think they were just, trolling through you know her past trying to find something that they could morph into a miracle so they could make her a saint yeah it's yeah i've done uh yeah i've done a lot of work in at my school with journalism and stuff like that i've done pieces on libertarianism uh, i just did one recently about the uh dress codes and stuff and how uh from a libertarian perspective, they make little to no sense because it's a public school. If it was private, it would be different because you have a choice. But if it's a government running it, then the government, then the same constitutional value should apply. It's just uh, confusing how uh, I kind of went over it, and I actually talked about it a lot in libertarian terms, and uh, I think it's going to get published, I don't know, but I've done a lot of essays as well, kind of like anti-war essays and stuff like that. Yeah, it, it is amazing how much opposition I got when I did a video saying, stop all war, and they're like, what? It's like, it, it's, it's, how I can, war's bad, people. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and that's when I wrote the kind of, I kind of compared it. In my essay, I kind of compared it to a sense where I said, I think our generation, generation that I am, that I'm in, kind of, it's, it, the generation that I'm in never really grew up in, like, a peacetime era, you know? It's kind of, we didn't have the opportunity to grow up in an era kind of like the, not not like the 90s, because there was a war there, but um, kind of like the 80s, you know, it just, it's kind of like, I don't, I, I don't know why I compared it to the generation that grew up during Vietnam, but it's kind of a comparison there, because uh, a lot of the time, they actually grew up during the war, and uh, our generation grew, uh, the generation that I'm in grew up during the Iraq and Afghanistan war. Yeah, I'm part of a Generation X, and it, it's like we, it, we kind of feel betrayed by those who came before us because they were saying, oh, no, this is going to be the, the future we build is going to be all about peace and love and harmony. And then they actually grew up and got into power and actually kicked the wars up to 11 and you know, yeah. started spending money like crazy going into debt that now we have to pay. Yeah, and it's kind of like I wrote in it... Um kind of we don't want to see our relatives or siblings come back from war with their legs blown off and PTSD and all this shell shock and chronic pain and stuff. We don't want to see that shit because uh, a lot of it was based on a lie, be it the WMDs in Iraq and stuff. Why should they go off and fight a war because uh, Bush lied? Well, it, it wasn't just Bush. It was all sorts of people in, you know, the FBI and the CIA and stuff like that. And that's what gets me because that's the only thing they're putting up for the reason why we know that <coughs> Trump colluded with Russia to hack the election. Oh, because we've got these people who say they have evidence. They won't show it to us, but they say, I'm like, these are the same people who lied to us about Iraq. They lied to us about, you know, NSA spying on us. They went up, you know, into congress and a congressional hearings under oath and lied under oath about it and we're just supposed to trust them on this yeah and when i tried to 
criticize that. I actually, it was a picture. It was like the New Yorker cover. It was like, it was like the Twin Towers descending into the ground. And I kind of just made a commentary about how I thought it represented uh, post 9-11 paranoia about the whole people fearing terrorism when it's a very low risk when we look at the numbers and we just grew up in a culture of fear and a huge thing of war, even though a lot of those wars were unjustifiable. And uh, a lot of us had to grow up through that. And the uh, thing is, a lot of it could have been averted. Well, people just suck at assessing risk. You know, the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis has done all of this, showing that, that those uh, more rare kinds of risks, like a mass shooting or a terrorist attack or something like that, people wildly exaggerate the chance of those, but then wildly underestimate the chances of getting, like, cancer or heart disease or, you know, the really big killers in this country. Yeah. And the essay where I wrote it, it was my English class, I plain out called Bush a war criminal. I called Dick Cheney a war criminal. The people who perpetrated that war were war criminals and were on the same level as Saddam Hussein in many aspects. Yeah. And um, um, oh my God, it was, uh, was it, was it Dick Cheney who just died or? I'm not sure. Oh God. One of them, one of them just died. And even people like that, uh, that Cortez woman, you know, Miss, you know, socialist was saying about how, oh, he was so wonderful. He was, uh, uh, and I think like the Washington Post called him, you know, like a champion of the, the people and for human rights and things. Oh, John McCain. Thanks, David. Yeah, that was it. John uh, McCain. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm like, what? What are you talking about? The guy was a paranoid warmonger. You know? Yeah. He, you know, yeah, I kept I mean, on the, even even people on the left are just saying about how wonderful he was. No, he wasn't. Sorry, he wasn't. I I always do parodies whenever we're uh, saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I add in either a tyrannical leader or whatever, and I'm like, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, one nation under Mao, indivisible. <laughs> <laughs> and uh I just vary it all the time and people are like, oh my gosh, how could you say that? And I'm like, well, what's the difference? Though America is corporatist and it's a little bit better than communism, we're still under a tyrannical uh, uh, government and stuff like that. Uh, tyrannical authoritarian governments are still authoritarian governments, no matter what their ideology is. Yeah, I, I mean, when you've got one president from one party, you know, like Obama, just doing everything unilaterally without having to pass it through Congress. And now you that all those powers have been inherited by Trump, who's doing the same thing and even more of it. I mean, that's what you're doing. It's just Harry Brown said it. If you give a good politician the power to do good, you automatically give a bad politician the power to do bad. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's kind of. Yeah, it's just kind of crazy to me where um, whenever I try to bring up anti-war and libertarian points and just the idea of uh, self-armament and stuff like that, people are like, well, the military is different than the people and they should be allowed to have the guns and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, what if that military becomes tyrannical? And they're like, well, they won't. We have a democratic government. And I'm like, uh... Have you not seen the Weimar Republic? Oh, yeah, there were, there were plenty of cases of that. I love to eat off is talking about a video from Larkin Rose that I haven't seen, but the, you know that, that thing they always give you about, I guess he's talking about the person's dying of thirst in the desert. The guy has a bottle of water, and he says, I'll sell it to you for 100 bucks or something like that. And yeah. So he has it's, an argument uh, about that. Yeah, there was one argument. I, I You know the girl I was talking about. Um the voluntarist communist. I have no idea why. Voluntarist, I'll just say voluntarist. Um, I tried talking about how she tried bringing up the point, okay, there are free people in the middle of the ocean stranded and they can't make it five days more. Uh, they draw straws and uh, one person is eaten who gets the straw, short straw. Is that fair? And I said, uh, from a logical perspective, no, it's not fair because it requires force and uh she said well it was random so it was kind of fair and i'm like well that's the problem with utilitarians which uh 
which that's a point by, and I tried explaining how wrong it was, they try to come up with these absurd scenarios which would never really happen, uh, be it the whole train tracks and stuff like that. To try like to, the lifeboat scenarios, yeah. Yeah. They try to come up with those, and I think I kind of convinced her that it wasn't fair. And, well, even, and, and and it's like, we don't have to come up with wild scenarios like that when we argue against the state. We have, like, plenty of real-world examples to go by. Yeah, it's... what. Well, then I said, well, why couldn't those people have fished? Why, there are many solutions out of that problem right there. And uh, they said, well, this is the option. I'm like, well, no, no, that's not how... An, idea works there are many solutions out of something it's just not it's just not one way it's not like god's holding a gun to your head or whatever saying you better eat the eat that guy you no know, it's kind of like i gotta bring up ron swanson again that's saying you know give a man a fish eats for a day teach a man to fish eats for life and swanson was pointing out or you could just leave him alone you know fishing's not that hard yep and, uh, yeah, and I don't know. I think that a lot of, there are a lot of kids in my school that lean conservative, but there's a lot of kids that lean Democrats. And then you got us, which are the libertarians and stuff like that, be it there are a lot of kids in my school who are libertarian. And uh, it's kind of like, at, it's kind of hard for libertarians to speak up because both the left and the right are going to pounce on you. The Trollbucks is saying, isn't the U.S. a republic? Well, I mean, it was designed to be a republic, but the thing is, it's really become an oligarchy, and that's what happens uh, anytime you have a, um, a a power structure. You've got people who are going to, to take it, and that's what you have, and that's why, you know, they're generating all of this, you know, white versus black. Oh, you know, black people, you're held down because of white people. Women, you're held down because of the patriarchy and things like that. It's all a distraction so that we don't realize that the real enemy are, you know, the people in power, the Hillary Clintons and the Donald Trumps and all of that. Okay, I love to read off says the Peeldeer version of the argument is the person would have died had the capitalists not exploited them. Yeah, so I mean it's being out a hundred bucks versus dying, you know, that that's uh that's a good thing. But I mean it, it's like how are you gonna motivate someone to get water to the desert, you know, unless you you know, marginal utility, that's just that's just basic economics there. And um this is like what what people always say whenever, you know, there's a hurricane or an earthquake or somewhere, there's this disaster. And people come in with all this bottled water and start selling, you know, bottled water for like five bucks a pop or something like that. And they go like, well, you're price gouging. You're exploiting those people. And I'm like, okay, how much water have you brought into that area? Okay. Because if that figure is none, then I don't want to hear from you. Yeah. I mean, how expensive is it to get a to get bottled water into the desert or into a a disaster area or whatever? Yeah, assuming they let you in and don't turn back like FEMA keeps doing every time they show up. Like, um, I know they did this with Hurricane Andrew. I think it was when Dixie and I think Walmart tried to do the same thing after Katrina. They were sending just truckloads in of stuff to donate. And FEMA turned them around and said, no, 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 you can't come in. It's like, what? How are you helping? You're in the way. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, a lot of people come up with these uh, large abstract scenarios which make no sense by logic and economics, though. Why... How, how difficult is it to get water in the desert as long as there is a uh, demand? Yeah, but now I think it's Lake Mead they're talking about is going to be a problem. 
And there, there was also a lake in Russia that before the USSR, it was this nice big lake. And then now it's just kind of drained it off, you know, as they're using it for, you know, irrigation and, uh, you know, drinking water and things like that. But it's the tragedy of the commons. The problem is no one owns it. So no one has an incentive to maintain it and keep the water levels up. Everyone's got the incentive to just use as much water as they can. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of... Yeah, they definitely do that. It's interesting how uh, people come up with absurd scenarios. Yeah, I'm looking at what Harry Alexander in the chat saying about it, but I mean, the idea here... It's called marginal utility. If you're in the desert and all you have is one gallon of water and that's got to get you through however long it takes to get to the desert, that's really precious to you and you're going to save that for drinking water and it's really valuable. So you might be willing to pay a hundred bucks for it, but the more water you get, the less valuable it is. And once you start getting more water, then you start not just drinking it, but you start bathing you start washing your car you know watering your lawn things that are less and less important the more than you get of it and that's what marginal utility says is that the price of water is the price of the next unit not the first because if you want drinking water, you're just going to pay you know the same price you're not going to pay a hundred dollars for that first gallon and then you know lesser prices for all of it you're going to pay the low price based on you know how plentiful water is in your area so that's marginal utility there. Yeah, it's just if there's a will, there's a way. If there's a demand for something, people will find a way to import it. Yeah, and if the guy is exploiting the people in the desert with hundred dollar, you know, bottles of water and it's possible to bring it in cheaper, then that's an incentive for someone to come in and sell them for ninety five and undercut him and get their business, and then maybe someone else can come in and you know, sell them for 90 or whatever. Competition takes care of that. Because I've said, I said, I detailed all this in my quickie on price gouging. It's a signal to other people saying, hey, we need more water over here. So, I mean, it gives them a market incentive to come and supply it, and then you get yeah. more water coming in, and then there's pretty soon there's not a shortage anymore. And how is that a bad thing? But if you say, no, we're going to stop the price gouging, you stop that in its tracks and then people don't get water. And how is that a good thing? Yeah, you create a huge uh, disincentive to uh, price your goods, um, price your goods in an appropriate manner according to the supply and demand versus uh, a price gouging, anti-price gouging measure, which will just make it so it runs out faster. Yeah, it's a price support, and when that's uh, below equilibrium, you have the demand being greater than the supply. And so what uh, happens is the first, you know, two people or whatever to go and get one. We're seeing this right now, in fact, in North Carolina. You know, my wife says, you know, that, that people cleared out the bottled water there in a couple of days, and everyone's coming in complaining about, you know, why isn't there bottled water? And it's like, well, the first people who got here got it. It's like when you're gonna when you're gonna get some more in. It's like, well, we're not because Harris Teeter is sending the bottled water to the coast where people are actually gonna need it. It's it's gonna hit here. We don't know how hard, but it's not gonna be as hard as you know the people on the coast. And and of course they complain about that, but I mean that that's how it is. You gotta send the supplies to where they're needed, and they have the incentive to do that. I mean Walmart was just stocking you know just basic cheap gallons of water. You know, filtered water or whatever. I think I got some spring water from that and some distilled water. But, you know, they, they were just you know, stocking what they could, but most of it's going to the coast because that's where the biggest problem is, so that's where the biggest demand for it is. Yeah. They actually have these, these systems at their central office that will pretty much automatically detect when there's a spike in demand. So they can actually, you know, kind of get ahead of everyone else as soon as there's an indication of disaster. 
they're rerouting supplies there. That's what the free market does for you. How long does it take before FEMA finally gets there? <laughs> Takes and oh, our governor weeks. has declared a state of emergency. Wow, I feel so much safer now. What does that even mean? That's just words. Does take weeks for a FEMA response to happen. Katrina is a prime example of that. What stops a defense company from demanding power for their protection? Things that stops the military, yeah, which is basically nothing. Yeah. Well, I mean, in an NCAP society, you'd have competition. And here you, you, you don't. And it's like, well, what if, you know, people say, you know, what, what, what if rich people will, you know, will be able to buy their way out? Well, they're doing that already. I mean, you or I get caught using drugs and we go to jail with the father stabbers and the mother rapers. If you're a celebrity or a politician, you just check into the Betty Ford Clinic and, you know, enjoy the, the luxury accommodations there. Yeah, it's very interesting how that a celebrity can get away with all these drug charges and stuff like that, and sometimes they have children, yet a suburban mom smoking pot will have her kids taken away by the state. Yeah. But, I mean, it, it's just the fact that people are coming up with all this fear-mongering about what would happen in a capitalist society, but the stuff they're talking about already happens, you know, with, with, with this huge state. Yeah, that's and it's, it's really ironic to read like, you know, Lysander Spooner writing about this stuff in the 19th century. And he's talking about, you know, how big government has gotten and how terrible and tyrannical it is. And we compare that to today. I think we'd all kind of rather the government be the size it was in Spooner's day because it's just gotten that much worse since then. Yeah, it is very interesting how we look back on how people perceive big government back then but we would rather have it that way. Yeah, I mean, I wonder what Spooner would have had to say about things like income tax. Yeah, Spooner would have freaking had a heart attack, for God's sakes. Well, I think if he could see today's society, he would say, what is wrong with you people? You are so rich. No one is suffering. No one is starving. These poor people you're pointing to and saying how horrible their life is is better than most people lived, you know, in my time. And you're complaining about it and you're wanting government to do more and you've made this government so huge you've got a $20 trillion debt. What is wrong with you people? Yeah, he... It's just when you... If you get people back then who were complaining about it, they'll look at this nowadays and they'll think, holy shit, how did it get out of hand? Yeah, everyone should read Spooner and Knock and all of those. Yeah. I actually recommended Bastiat the Law to one of my history teachers. And they said, I don't know who Bastiat is. And I'm like, Ow. and I'm like, Wait, you teach European history and you don't know who Bastiat is? Well, it's not in the government-approved curriculum that he's reading from. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. We have Common Core up here, and it's bullshit. Oh, God. I mean, the, the charter school uh, my girls go to, um, before Common Core, they had their own curriculum which was great and wonderful. And, you know, they were one of the best schools in the state. And then the state mandated common core on all schools, including charters. And it actually set them back. And I mean, it's like the students don't like it. The teachers don't like it. The administration doesn't like it. Even the teachers unions have come out against common core. I'm like, who likes this thing? Yeah. A lot of people come out against it. And I've talked to teachers about this. Do you like Common Core or do you not? And uh, they always are hesitant to voice their opinion about it. The charter school aren't. They'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it's just amazing because a lot of, I mean, I can look at it and I can kind of see what they're doing and I can see what their goal is. Their goal is to get kids to kind of think through things like math problems and understand the concepts behind it. But the way they implement it is it's just more rote learning, do these steps and this is the way you do it. And yeah, it's kind of like coloring between the uh, coloring in between the lines, no margin for error, even though error allows people to understand a concept better, be it mistakes. Yeah, well, and it's also the fact that there's more than one way to accomplish something. You know, and a lot of it should be about thinking way through and about being, uh, you know, being creative about how you attack these problems, but. You know, every time government comes up with a curriculum, that's exactly what it doesn't do. Yeah. I mean, I think that the basis for certainly math classes, but maybe even a lot others, starting with kindergarten, is teaching kids to code. Yeah. I mean, you, you could start in kindergarten, you know, everyone look up turtle graphics. This is a a great way for kids to learn the turtle. Well, when I was growing, it was basically a triangle. We've got better graphics now, but you move it around on the screen, but you move it around by telling it what steps to go through. They've actually got a version of it that runs on Python. So once you start getting maybe into third and fourth grade and you start getting better at spelling and everything, then you can kind of go behind it and see the Python code that's controlling the turtle. And then by the time you're in high school, you're basically doing it. The, the test would be, you know, write a Python script to solve, you know, this kind of algebra problem. Yeah. And then you do it and then you'd run it and they would give it a whole bunch of problems and you'd, it, it would be basically based on how well you did. Yeah. I take a computer science class online. It's not Khan Academy. It's like Edgenuity or whatever, but um, there's just a lot of options out there. Yeah. Khan Academy is good. There's also Code Academy. Which yeah, is about I've coding. tried that. I've, I've done a few rounds in that, just kind of freshing up on things and kind of updating my skills. And, oh, there's another one. I forget what it is, but it's in the form of a game. So kids love it, but it teaches you Python as you go through it. And what you're basically doing is writing Python scripts to control the characters in the game and I forget what it's called, but I mean, it was, it was great. I mean, that's a great way to get kids into it. Harry Alexander says, my math curriculum will be Euclid and Python slash JavaScript. That's a good okay. start, but I think I, I'd probably want some uh, Linhard Euler in there. Yeah. You can never go wrong with the element. How about just a whole Tom Lehrer based curriculum? You can do it that way. Yeah, but I mean, when you learn to code, you learn reasoning skills, you learn critical thinking, you learn problem solving. You know, you can learn things like decision trees, things you can actually use in your actual day-to-day -day life. Angry says, I need to know how to code. I get the logic, just not the languages. Yeah, I mean, you'd probably have Angry a, a, an easy time with Code Academy because it's, it's really good at laying all that out for you. Yeah, coding is a very interesting, uh, it's very interesting. I learned a lot via, um, I learned a lot, be it reasoning skills, stuff like that, even creativity, trying to solve problems and such. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of lateral thinking involved, and that, that's really what a proper math class would, would be about things. It's not just about, by rote, this is how you solve a math problem. It's here's something kind of funky and out of the way, and you kind of have to think laterally to solve it. Yeah. Uh, with 
PEMDAS and stuff like that, it's very linear. Yeah. Here we are, it says, we full on Montessori, let the Prussian method rot. Well, what I've seen of the Montessori method is really good. I don't know how much of this, because Montessori isn't a protected term. Anyone can just call themselves a Montessori school, so I don't know how much the Montessori schools around here are indicative of, of how they are elsewhere. But the basic idea is all of your, your, all of your actual sitting down and learning stuff is in the mornings, Monday through Thursday, and then in the afternoons and all day Friday, it's creative time where you, you, you just do things kind of on your own where you're trying to apply it or working with other people or whatever. So, I mean, it's not just sitting down in classes all day getting bored. Yeah, it's usually our routine starts with read out of a book, do the problems, listen to a half an hour lecture, then do online homework and it kind of gets boring after a while. Yeah. It's not really anything like that. And the thing is, they never really, whenever I try to uh, apply the financial concepts to math, they used to kind of say, oh, don't apply financial concepts and stuff like that, even though we were doing financial concepts. Yeah. It's like, don't overthink it. And I'm like, uh, I'm not overthinking it. Yeah, and I mean, money management is another skill that people could really use that they could teach in schools and they generally don't. Because a lot of reasons, what well, one big reason why there are poor people in this country is just because they don't know how to manage money. No one ever taught them that. And when you ask, you know, all these people are well-to-do, how come they're so well-to-do from generation to generation? Because generally the parents on their own are teaching their kids money management. They're homeschooling at least that portion of it. But I mean, if your parents don't know how to do it, how can they teach you? Yeah, it's a very interesting point how a lot of people, how in schools, they don't even teach about though taxation is wrong. They don't even teach kids about the fundamentals of uh, how taxation works and how, yeah. uh, how the IRS works and stuff like that. Harry mentions uh, grade levels are non-existent with the Montessori schools. Yeah, every, every student just uh, progresses at his or her own pace. And I think they even have like the ones who are better at a subject teach the, the younger ones, you know, things like that. I mean, if you want to learn how to do something, teach it. That is where you really learn something when you try to teach someone else how to do it. Yeah, um, I, yeah, that's kind of the experience I'm going through with teaching uh, kids uh, cybersecurity skills, basic hacking skills, stuff like that, you know? It's uh, very interesting. I've learned a lot. Yeah, I mean, the whole grade system is like everyone has to progress together and we're, you know, we're all doing the same. But, I mean, some students can progress really quickly at math and need a little more work with literature so you could advance them in math, but say them on literature, but they won't do that, you know, or vice versa or whatever. Let them advance in the subjects that they're good at, you know, and let them have some extra time working, you know, with the lower level on subjects they're not so good at, but the grade system just basically makes that impossible. Yeah. Yep, that is true. That is very true, though. The grading system in the United States is very messed up, uh, the state standard-wise. Yeah, I, I know, like, other countries do things differently. Like, I hear about... Um, British kids, you know, taking, they have O levels, which I think are occupational and then A levels, which are, um, academic and prepare you for like higher education, things like that. 
I don't know how you advance through them. I don't think they have discrete grades like we have here, though. Yeah, it's very interesting in other countries how uh, the free market in some countries have taken over and it's innovated uh, public school uh, public schools out of existence in those countries. Well, I mean, even if it wants to still have public schools, you know, the status will point to, oh, look at, you know, Sweden, look at Belgium, look at Finland, look at how good those schools are. And they're run by government. It's like, yeah, do you notice they have school choice? They have voucher systems. You know, a lot of them have, you know, really strong private schools that, you know, kids can go to because of the vouchers. And, of course, the competition makes the government schools better because they don't have a, a monopoly anymore. But here you say, hey, maybe we should have, you know, vouchers or educational tax credits or charter schools or something like that. And these same people hit the ceiling. Oh, no, we can't do that. It was like, but you just pointed to these countries and said they were good. And that's what they do. Yeah, it's very interesting how statists look at a successful situation and they try to make it into a failure, which never works. Snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Yeah. Well, and it's also a race to the bottom because what schools get more funding? It's the ones that do a terrible job because, oh, no, we need to fund these schools better because that's the problem. But what are you doing? You're incentivizing failure. Yeah, you're very, yeah, if you give more money to the schools, it's just going to create a lot more problems. And Harry Alexander says, oh, we can't, in quotes, because he's being sarcastic, we can't have parents making choices for their children. But I, I think that's it. It's, it's like, oh, you know, parents are stupid. Government knows better than parents. You know what? Out of race. And how can they possibly do that? Who knows kids better than their parents? How does some politician or bureaucrat, you know, somewhere in an office somewhere who's never even met the kid, you know, know what's best for that kid's education and what the best options are? and know better than the parent. It makes no sense. Yeah. It's, uh... Yeah, parents should be able to make a choice for their child as they are the, uh... uh as they are the, uh... part of that trusty relationship. And I think this also goes back to what we were talking about in the 19th century. There seems to be this running thread that Oh, if it weren't for governments, parents would be totally evil because that was why kids worked in the factories because these must have been like the worst parents in the world who made their kids go to the factory and work, you know, not because the family would have starved without it or anything like that. You know, and they say that today with education and other things. Like there was one kid, it was like a 12-year-old girl who was like walking her dog. And she was like, oh, that, that's horrible. You know, that, that kid could have been, you know, raped by a predator or something like that. Yeah. yeah, they think in the most abstract situations where it's most likely never going to happen. Yeah, and it's like kids have never been safer than they are today. And government has this reaction. It's like they're in so much danger. Oh, well, you could you know, let them do that in the 50s and 60s, but you can't let them do that today. They were in more danger doing it in the 50s and 60s than they are today. They are much safer today. Yeah, kids are very safe compared to back then. Yeah, I forget the lady's name, but she does that website, Free Range Kids. I think John Stossel's covered her a lot. So wait, government doesn't know how, this is Harry Alexander, government doesn't know how to manage its own nuclear facilities and have a D rating overall, but they know how to manage your children? Yeah. I don't think I understand the question that Trollbox is asking here.
But I mean, children are unique individuals. Their needs, I mean, a lot of it's going to be common, but a lot of it is also going to be unique to the child. That is true. And so they have to be treated on an individual level. And again, the parents are the ones who know best what that is with their own children. Yeah, individuals should be able to make decisions for their children. It just makes sense. Yeah, that's another one of our way controversial positions we're really going out on a limb here. It's amazing how the most obvious and logical things become controversial when you get the state involved. But it's like something else. I remember you know, when we were taught the Great Depression in school, it was like you said, you know, Hoover bad, Hoover bad, FDR good. But, you know, in, in going through it and all the stuff they were talking about and all the stuff for the banking and all the stuff for the credit and everything, I don't think they ever even once mentioned the Federal Reserve. There's actually a law that one of my friends came up with called Hoover's Law. And it can be applied to any politician of any era. Uh, whenever something good happens, uh, you... Uh, whenever something... Okay, for example. Uh, whenever something bad happens, even if it's under the current president, you blame Hoover. But if something good happens, you praise FDR. But, and it just goes up and down and up and down. I mean, that's what they were doing with... with with Obama, they were, you know, blaming everything on Bush, and there would be like a little minor tick upward in the uh, the employment rate, you know, with more people being employed. And they go, "Oh, yay! See, you know, Obama's economic policy is working." Then you'd have a regression to the mean; it would go down, and then would go down even further. And they were like, "Well, that's still Bush's fault." Yeah. Like, well, wait a minute. How long is Bush going to have control of the economy after he? Yeah. It's kind of like uh, how he summarized it was Bush, Obama, Bush, Obama, Bush, Obama. And it just goes, it's like a, it's like a freaking ping pong ball going around. Okay. So Trollbucks is talking about spanking. Um, I haven't watched Stefan Molyneux since he basically became a race realist. So I don't know if he's changed his mind on that, but the earlier Stefan Molyneux, the good Stefan Molyneux had a lot of really good videos about spanking and, and why it's a horrible thing that you should never do to your kids. Yeah, it is, it is abuse. Yeah, and I mean, what are you, what are you teaching? You're teaching the violence as a solution. Yeah. It's the very thing that's kind of perpetuating uh, a state. And it's like children who are spanked are more likely to grow up to commit violent crime and you know that's what you see see a lot of these people like all oh, these these you know kids today out you know being gangbangers and shooting up their parents should have spanked them well they it's more likely that their parents did spank them yeah yeah it also results in like lower IQ and stuff like that Because there's this myth going around. It's been going around for decades. I mean, I heard it as a kid. The myth is that your IQ is just set and constant, and it, that's what it is. That's not the case at all. You can learn things and increase your IQ, you know, if you're abused or something like that, and you end up with PTSD or something like that. That can actually lower your IQ. You know, that can change based on you know, what you learn and what, you know, mental exercises, you know, you have yourself doing and also your environment and what happens to you. You know, all those things can raise or lower your IQ. 
Yeah, environmental factors, uh, different stimuli, it can all affect it, even down to coffee and cigarettes can affect it. So it's kind of weird to say, oh, it's an unshapeable thing. No, it is shapeable. It can be influenced by many factors. So oh, I mean, just look at the, the Flynn effect because it's going up by, what, three points every decade or something like that, the average IQ. So they have to keep resetting it because by definition, 100 needs to be the, the median IQ. But it's like if you have a 100 IQ and then you, you know, went and took a test from, you know, 1970 or something like that, you know, it's going to be like you, you would register like 115 or 120 or something like that. Because that's how much the average IQ, you know, has increased since then. And I mean, that's way too fast for it to be evolution, for it to be genetic or anything like that. Yeah, you know, that's happening within occurs, generations. Evolution occurs gradually over time. That wouldn't be gradual. Yeah, and I mean, it makes minor changes from one generation to the next, and this is happening way too quickly for that. And that's one so. thing that Stefan Molyneux started getting wrong when he started becoming a race realist was when he was comparing like the IQs of whites and blacks. If you, you know, look at the data for the Flynn effect and kind of dig down into it and deaggregate it, everyone's IQ is going up, including blacks. And that disparity between the, uh, the average IQ of blacks and whites is narrowing. And if it continues at this trend, I think it's like less than 10 years, uh, the IQ of blacks and whites will be within a standard deviation of each other, which basically means they're, for all intents and purposes, the same. Yeah. Yep. People tend to ignore things. The angry Froman says, "Yeah, he, but he doesn't look at someone and say that person is black. He's inherently dumb." But that's true. He doesn't say that. But you know, he is talking about, you know, the average IQ. But I mean, that's that's changing that that's a lot more that that's a lot more changeable than he's making it out to be. And, and that's what a lot of the uh, anti-immigration people say, Oh, well, these you know immigrants are coming in and they have lower IQs. Well, yeah, because they're leaving socialist shitholes and you grew up in a socialist shithole. You probably are going to have a lower IQ, but they'll come over here and they'll start enjoying the blessings of freedom, you know, that will raise their IQ. Their kids will grow up with an IQ more in line with, you know, people around them, you know, natives. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people tend to think that, oh, the immigrants are coming over here, so they must have a lower IQ. Us natives are better. It's like, no, that's not necessarily the case. Well, I mean, if you live in a country with a richer economy, you're going to have, because a lot of this is things like child nutrition, uh, neonatal nutrition, and even things like getting on the, the, the prenatal vitamins and things like that. I, I saw a study and it wasn't just IQ, it was all sorts of stuff, like all sorts of different birth defects and mental defects. And normally when women find out they're pregnant, it's like, you know, three or four weeks in, if not later, and they find out they're pregnant and they start going on the prenatal vitamins. Well, women, a lot of women who are trying to get pregnant, their doctors say, okay, go ahead and get on the prenatal vitamins. So they're already on it when they get pregnant. The ones who do that have far better outcomes in those areas when their kids are born than the ones who waited until they knew they were pregnant to start taking them. So, I mean, those first few weeks even are really critical and can make a huge difference. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a huge factor that's involved with it. All right, it's about time to wrap it up. The chat room's kind of hopping, so we might go on a few more minutes, see what they have to say. I don't think the issue is that illegal immigrants are coming in dumber. Yeah, I've, I've actually heard them say that. That's what they say the issue is. 
but they go into states to give them free stuff like where they used to live, but isn't in the, the dumps yet. And that's something else they say, oh, well, it's the welfare state. Well, yeah, the, the welfare state is a problem, but the solution to that is get rid of the welfare state. So, you know, and, and I went through this and how to argue for immigration restrictions. You can't use one government program to ar argue for the existence of another, you know, to solve the problems of that. The, if that's causing a problem, then the solution is to get rid of that first. Um, that first problem. But actually, that's not really what's happening because immigrants use uh, government benefits like welfare at a lower rate than natives do. So it's not that they're coming over here for free stuff. In fact, a lot of them, a lot of those options are only available to citizens and certainly aren't available to illegals who have to remain undocumented. You know, so it's, it's just, it just doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, it is probably causing a problem for the welfare state, but that doesn't really seem to be the reason why they're coming in because they don't use it like natives do. Yeah, a lot of people have a misconception on immigration, illegal immigration, and a whole bunch of stuff. People think, oh, they're abusing welfare. Well, they're more, well, they're more less likely to, uh, to abuse welfare. And I love to eat off. I remember studies about diet sodas not helping people lose weight. Think about those studies is at least all the ones I've seen are just really small. They look at like 20 or 30 people instead of hundreds of people. And they all seem to have a different reason why, because they go in and they look at it and say, what's going on? And they say, oh, well, it's this. Oh, well, it's that. It's the, you know, gut flora. It's, you know, the pancreas. It's, you know, other things like that. And since they all have different reasons for it, it seems to me that with the small sample size they have, they're just looking at kind of random effects. And I mean, maybe if you, if you put them all together, you know, it doesn't, you, you would think that they would be able to find a singular cause for it and they just don't. So that makes me really skeptical about them. The people not losing weight are just eating fast food and drinking diet drinks with the food. Yeah, that's the, the Peltzman effect, Peltzman effect was actually with um, with safety systems. The more safety systems you put in, the more risks people take. But I mean, it's the same thing here. If people have this idea of, oh, you know, I'm drinking a diet cola, so, you know, I'm not getting calories from that, so I can eat this Big Mac. Well, you know, now you're getting more calories than you would if you were just, you know, on a, on a proper diet. All right, it's after 10 o'clock. I need to sign off for the evening. Yeah. Well, well thanks it was for... nice being on the uh, live stream with you, Shane. Yeah, thanks for joining me, and thanks to everyone in the chat room. And, I mean, this is for the patrons. We only had one come in, and he didn't really say anything, David. But uh, thanks for the support, and thanks to everyone in the chat room. And thanks for everyone who is... Uh, viewing this and supporting my channel, even if it's just by viewing and sharing the videos, you know, hitting like and subscribe and spreading them around. So until next time, stay strong and be free. Amen. <laughs>